If you ever heard one of these themes, Then it means that you've had an awesome childhood. While my dad got us a PlayStation somewhere around September of the year 2000, my personal adventure with the Sonus Dream Machine began around 1998 when my aunt, who took part in many competitions such as crosswords and quizzes in which you could win prizes, managed to win a PlayStation, along with every number of the official Polish PlayStation magazine released prior to the competition and a further two-year subscription for her daughter, my cousin, and for pretty much everyone, the biggest attraction of the magazines were the included demo discs. While the demos themselves were rather short and you could see everything that the disc offers in about an hour or two, it was always a joy to check on the various games they've included. We visited her rarely, but I enjoyed watching her play a lot. I still remember when she let me play the game called Clone, just to screw with me. I was traumatized and had nightmares for a year. I still get creeps playing it. That was another part of the demo discs. They included games made by amateurs using the Netia Rose dev kit. While simple, they offered a lot of replayability. Some of these games were really, really good. And I hope that at least some of those guys became professionals. Time Slip hit the Xbox Arcade in 2011 and Mitsuru Kamiyama became director of the Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. I remember that each month I called my cousin so she could tell me what cool games they included. I'll never forget how she described the first level of Crash Bandicoot 3 to me, death animations and all. I also had a really cringe moment when, on vacation at my grandma's house, I asked her, while she was really sick, can I take your PlayStation if you die? <laughs> Of course, she told that to everyone and they laughed at the six-year-old me. Overall, she wasn't all that into gaming, just turning her PlayStation on from time to time to play her favorite demos. She never bought a full game or molded her console to play the much cheaper pirated versions. She bought a DualShock to play Ape Escape though. I don't blame her, it was a demo of a really cool game, plus having a second controller allowed her to play multiplayer in games featuring that option, with Bomberman World being everyone's favorite. Though we still gravitated towards the OG Grand Theft Auto for obvious reasons, even if the game itself was really clunky. But I think that everyone else around her was much more interested in that little grey box. During the summer break of 2000, my dad offered her a small amount of money to borrow the console with every demo disc she had. I guess my dad wanted to test it or wanted to play some games before he would gather the money for our own console. Each evening, after he came from work, he checked out one or two demo discs while I was watching. 
it was something truly amazing with so many different games in front of me some were scary others were full of action most of them were very colorful and then there were the really weird games my dad didn't like those and quickly got frustrated with them sadly again what I have to say, and I'm not sure if it's just a sign of how good the PS1 library was, but these demos were really well made. Sure, most of them ended after about 5 minutes, but they were great at making the player interested, and they stayed on my mind for a long time. They were like little windows that enabled me to see only for a little while, potential alternative futures where I got the game in question. In my head, I tried to piece together what the full versions would look like based on my limited information. I was always so disappointed when a demo proved to be a trailer, especially when the game looked really cool, though more often than not they were brilliantly edited with very enjoyable music. I rewatched the Speed Freaks trailer tens of times just to listen to that one track. I know that this will make me sound like an old man, but I think that this poverty gaming made me a lot more open-minded from the start of my adventure with video games. There wasn't a genre that I didn't at least give a chance to, with demo versions being much more rare, the various free-to-play games and the popularity of Let's Plays on the internet, kids are less likely to try the multitude of different games by themselves. Now, thanks to the ever-growing presence of various gaming subscription services like Game Pass or PS Plus, the ability to try games that you wouldn't bother with otherwise is making a bit of a return. My cousin, who dedicated most of his life to then Championship and now Football Manager and FIFA, Racking up thousands of hours in these games, thanks to PS Plus, which he bought to demolish other players online, has tried multiple game genres that he would previously scoffed at. He actually got kind of addicted to Slay the Spire at some point, to my absolute surprise. <clears throat> While my dad banned me from touching the console till he returned home from work, probably being scared that I would somehow break it and he would have to reimburse my cousin for it, my mom, who was working night shifts so she was at home with me and my younger sister, played these demos with me. I'll never forget how I cheered her on when she played Spyro the Dragon, how amazed and charmed we both were when we discovered Clonoa, or the moment when a black disc named Euro Demo 37 was put into the borrowed PlayStation for the first time. It had that creepy animated background that looked like a diseased skin with something underneath it, but I've managed to ignore it and the droning music, keeping my attention on the bright pink buttons that represented the games. We picked one of them and nothing was the same again. I was greeted by a very weird intro, followed by a funky musical tune in tandem with a nice title screen, and after pressing the start button, I was then thrown to a wacky, cartoony world where I met the titular hero, Tombi. His spiky pink hair, green pants, expressiveness and his weapon of choice have instantly made me a fan of him. 
His design is just so striking and memorable, even despite its simplicity. I think that character being simple and easy to draw is a must if you create something targeted to children. And let me tell you, Tombi's adventures have dominated my sketchbook for at least two months. I didn't draw anything else but the pink-haired cavemen fighting funny-looking pigs and birds. I also included the UI elements in my drawings, emulating the video game, because the health gauge, life counter, the menus, they are all wonderfully done and I just couldn't imagine Tombi without them. I've obviously skipped the massive amount of dialogue bubbles that the local guide thrown at me and started immersing myself in gameplay, being floored by the visuals. While other games were colorful and nice looking as well, Tombi had that cartoon from the early 90s feel to it, mixed with a pop-up book. Thanks to the way how the game takes place on two planes, the background and the foreground, the color palette, the way everything is animated, the masterfully drawn backgrounds with clearly discernible objects that the player can interact with, pair that with catchy tunes and silly sound effects and you have something truly special. Even with my mom's watchful eye, I didn't venture too far. I actually got stuck on the first screen of the game with a wall of thick fog blocking my way, but that didn't spoil my fun. I treated that one screen as a toy box, running around, striking pigs with my blackjack, and then doing all these amazing throws, amusing myself by jumping on a plant looking like a bat, making a farting sound in the process, swinging on the branches, eventually even reaching the tree's crown and talking to a monkey. I even entered the house and discovered a weird cutscene. I could spend more than half an hour on just that screen, having fun. I didn't understand the language, and honestly, even if I did, I was too impatient to read all the dialogue and signs. Being used to how short most demos were, I just accepted that the, this is all I'm going to get from this demo, and didn't try to fight the fog. But the thoughts of what lies behind it were always on my mind. With the summer vacation ending, we visited my aunt and returned the PlayStation to my cousin. I asked her if we could play my favorite demo together. She accepted, and after about five minutes, my mind was blown, just like the fog. She showed me that the demo actually had more to offer, a lot more. Long story short, we played that demo for about an hour and a half, trying to discover everything it has to offer together. And looking back at it, I have to say that we did most of it, about 90%. For comparison, it took me 58 minutes during my current playthrough to fully complete the content included in the demo version. The people at Whoopi Camp were really generous. Which brings me to... Whoopi Camp was created by Tokuro Fujiwara, a very talented game designer who started his journey with Konami in 1982. His stay there was short, ending in 1983, but during those two years he was a part of Puyan and Rock and Rope, the latter being his first game developed from scratch. He then joined Capcom and was part of many successful, well-liked games, like Ghosts and Goblins series, Commando, 
Bionic Commando, where he used his experience of developing rock and roll, Mega Man 2 to 7, DuckTales, Chippendale 1 and 2, Sweet Home, Little Nemo, Final Fight 1 to 3, Breath of Fire 1 and 2, ending with the original Resident Evil. Though his input during that last project was quite limited, during his 13 years at Capcom, Fujiwara polished his skills, built contacts and friendships, and became genuinely respected. Even if he was quite infamous for his strict attitude, With the release of Resident Evil, Fujiwara left Capcom, leaving his well-paid and secure job to follow his dreams of creating his own studio. Whoopi Camp was funded entirely from Fujiwara's pocket. Some of his colleagues from Capcom also joined his fledgling studio, wholeheartedly believing in him. Tombi, or Tomba, as the game is known in territories other than PAL, was their first game. Released in December 1997 in Japan, and in the summer of 1998 everywhere else, the Japanese version was kind of rushed, to say it nicely. Other releases were too, but not to the level of the Japanese release which felt like a glorified beta. Sadly, there were a lot of problems with the publishing and marketing of Tombi, which caused the game to be quite rare. It was so rare, in fact, that even the local pirates didn't have it, so I never got to play it when it was so important to me. We'll get back to this topic multiple times, in fact. The full version of Tombi starts with a really nicely animated intro that in the PAL version uses a song by a British boy band called North and South. It's weird, but weirdly fits for whatever reason. But what the hell is this game even about? Well, there's this mysterious cabal of sentient pigs with magic powers that terrorizes the inhabitants of various lands for fun and profit. And then we have our hero, a pink-haired caveman boy who isn't afraid of anything and decides to intervene. He screws up loses a golden bracelet, a memento from his grandpa, and decides to get it back. In the process he meets four other grandpas, each older than the other, and seals each evil pig away in a bag, dispelling their magic from the affected lands. Each person I've told this synopsis didn't really believe me, something that I completely understand. I still remember how my dad told me about a movie about two old men who spent their remaining days getting drunk, eating cabbage soup and farting, and one night their farting summoned an alien. I didn't believe him, but it was true, and the movie was good. Something that I couldn't appreciate when I was younger is the fact that while the game respects the intelligence of its players, it constantly gives directions and casually mentions the existence of events and items, if the player takes notice of it, of course. NPCs and signs are really helpful and I strongly advise you to interact with them at all times. Seriously, I can count the number of events that aren't casually foreshadowed by an NPC on one hand, probably. Which segues us to the way the game is structured, which was, and I would say it still is, something one of a kind for a platformer. 
During his adventure, Tombi will encounter many events, which are divided into two categories. Primary ones, like clearing the fog or reaching the 100-year-old man, and secondary ones, like delivering a frog to the pond. Events work pretty much like missions or quests in the other games. You get points for finishing events, but discovering them sometimes also gives you small amount of points. AP, or adventure points, is the scoring system of the game. You gain them through events, defeating the enemies in style, and collecting variously colored gems and fruits. You need to reach certain score thresholds to open 3 AP boxes and to finish some events. They also affect your level, which you can see while saving or loading the game. A level has no other functions outside of giving you 3 additional lives each time you level up. Outside of leveling up, you'll find many additional lives in various treasure chests across the game. <coughs> Losing all your lives will force you to load the latest save, but it's quite unlikely to happen. While Tombi has a weapon from the start, his trusty blackjack, it only stuns the enemies, even when you fully charge your attack. It makes them easier to be grabbed, or as the game calls it, bite, and then thrown. If the thrown enemy hits a surface or an object, you'll get a cool 500 AP. Hitting another enemy will give you another 500. So, I know that I've told you how much I liked this screen as a kid. I still love it, but let's try to actually explore the game. As soon as we get near to the monkey, it will run away. We can reach it by swinging on the tree branches, but it won't do us anything other than telling us that the monkey is hungry. What we can do is to grab that plant and spray an unsuspecting coma pig with its pollen, shrinking the pig in the process. That's perhaps one of the only things that aren't mentioned by anything in the game, and I managed to discover it by myself during one of the demo sessions because, of course, I had to fart on the pig. It can be really tricky though, and it took me nearly 10 minutes to get it just right. In the grass, which slows Tombi down when he runs through it, we can find a frog that can be escorted to a pond. The frog will get frightened if you get hit and you'll have to catch it again, so be mindful of that. We break the big egg, collect a chick, and go to the back plane to get a tornado from the mailbox. With a tornado in our inventory, we can clear the fog, with the game knowing that the player knows how to use items from the inventory screen, it allows for further progression. But wait! See these weird accordion looking plants? Be sure to step on them until you squish the water out of them and make them change color. It will be really important for the sake of your sanity. Also, if you're starving for health, you can hit the pump rock with a charged up weapon attack for it to release a single fruit. It works only once per rock. Going deeper into the forest of all beginnings, we encounter biting plants. We can avoid them by jumping on these overgrown poppy heads. Pushing a fruit down by striking it will cause one of the biting plants to bloom and allow us to collect it. Beware that fruits don't respawn, so by collecting this one you won't be able to make the plant bloom. But don't worry, if you miss it you'll find another in a chest much later in the game. 
fruits come in two variations. Red heals 1 HP and blue heals 2 HP. As they don't respawn, returning to the previously visited locations will be a bit tougher. We break another egg and see a locked door which will stay locked for quite a while. Getting into a little hut, we can see a pair of eyes inside. Using a speak button will initiate a conversation with a weird character. The game doesn't tell you that you can speak or use something. You have to come to that yourself, which I approve. You're rewarded for your curiosity. And hey, the sign near the hut counts as a hint, I guess? Reaching the pond, we release the frog, encounter our first AP box, and get nearly drowned. At least we get bananas for our troubles. This guy is actually quite right, though. We really aren't ready for what's behind him. Gifting bananas to the monkey will make us friends, friends for, life. for life. As Sphinx, Charles teaches us the animal dash. By pressing square and not letting it go, we can run much faster and jump farther. It's really useful. We smash two more eggs on our way, avoid a chest we can't open, and we reach 100 years old man's house. Uh, after that, the old man will ask us to bring him four chicks that were stolen by coca birds. If you haven't collected all of them, Tomby will just jump out of the window. If you have all four of them on you, we'll discover where Tomby stores his entire inventory and get rewarded with story time. The audio mixing is on par with mine. Until seven evil pigs came, they suddenly appeared and used their powers to change the slime. But the animation and the story itself are quite good. Seven evil pigs curse the continent and are scouring it for gold, and we have to do something about it. We also get a 100 year old key which will allow us to open some of the chests lying all over the continent. There are four types of chests, each one fancier than the previous. With the key we received, we can only open the lame wooden chests. But hey, that's a start! Before progressing to the forest of 100 flowers, we backtrack a little, opening our first chest, Charity Wings serve as a fast travel system, allowing us to teleport between the saving signs. Meeting the owner of those eyes inside the hut, Jan is a ninja and will play hide and seek with us through the game. And by skillfully swinging around, we get to another chest. This one has our first vitality max which permanently increases the health gauge. The final wooden chest contains the 100-year-old bell, which will transport Tomby to 100-year-old man without the need to use a charity wing. If you're hurt, our new grandpa will fully recover Tomby's health. Climbing the rope, we reach... The music... The feeling of autumn, the crinkling of leaves, it's extremely cozy here, even if trees look quite sick. We meet a dwarf who will speak some gibberish and run away. Our first objective is to learn the dwarvish language by biting the native speakers. I mean, I'm sure you could learn some flowery words by doing this in real life. The mounds of leaves force us to jump around the forest. While doing so, sooner or later, a leaf butterfly will fly out, trying to get away from us. 
Obviously, everything in this game is there for a reason, so catching it is advised. Now just repeat that 24 more times. If you're lucky and quick, two butterflies can spawn at once, enabling you to get 26 butterflies in the forest of 100 flowers, when normally they stop spawning after you get 25 of them here. It's best to get them now, as traversing the forest will soon become quite annoying. Also, I've heard about tree bark mods, but only after doing the research for this video did I find out that leaf butterflies are a thing too. Huh. Most of the forest is closed off, so we concentrate on learning the language, while remembering about the pump rocks, of course. In the pursuit of knowledge, we wander into the village. Our language skills are not sufficient, so only some parts of the sentences will make sense to us. But not for long, as we met our last teacher in the back of the village. Understanding more brings more problems, obviously. We soon get our next assignment. Some dwarfs are in trouble and we have to rescue them. There's seven of them, get it? Trapped all around the forest, including two newly opened sections, Wobbly Wharf, which is more of a bridge, and the Watchtower area. Also, there are now enemies everywhere, which is why I suggested getting all those butterflies before reaching the village. As soon as we enter Wobbly Wharf, a puppy runs our way. We can turn back, jump on a spore to get it, and take it to a village doctor, as the poor thing is hurt. We name him Baron, which is a pretty badass name if you ask me. To help him heal, we need to collect a healing herb from a place we don't have access to yet. Wobbly Wharf is the only place where we can encounter Butamushi, or pig insects. They are a bit trickier than the normal enemies, as the spikes on their backs prevent us from jumping on them, forcing us to stun them first. They also give out blue experience, but that's a talk for later. There is also a spiked barrel, but do not attack it with a charged attack. If you break it completely, you won't be able to finish every event in the game. Instead, break its spikes and push it into the water. The finale of this event will disappoint you. But hey, we have a bucket now. Watchtower is a bit more interesting. It also features new enemies, propeller bugs, or just spiders. They can move quite erratically, and hitting them will cause them to flip over, which makes them dangerous to jump on. Also, the field of spikes here consists of countless remains of the dead propeller bugs, so that's a nice, if gruesome, touch. We get our second pair of pants. Which isn't all that better, it just helps to jump a bit higher. The physics-based platforms here are quite fun to play with, and the way the water drops act is quite impressive. You can collect them using a bucket, which, if full, can be used to extinguish a campfire containing a baked yam. Presenting it to a dwarven woman in the village will net us another vitality max. Damaging Watchtower will ask a question that will be answered much later. Fun fact, it was the event I forgot to complete during this playthrough. At the top, there's a really nice observation deck. Someone displays the telescope, but it takes only a few seconds to fix this mistake, and we're treated to another little cutscene. 
That island was curiously erased from the map in the western releases and probably intended to be a bigger part of the game. Maybe a final dungeon? Sadly it got scrapped. If only that was the only thing left on the cutting room floor. Eh. By pushing a big rock off the cliff, we help work on the local space program and also uncover a magic mirror for later. There is a mysterious crystal ball on the roof of the entrance waiting to be grabbed. Our key allows us to open a chest suspended in the air containing a new weapon, wooden boomerang. It has the same strength as blackjack, travels a shorter distance, but allows us to grab items from a distance, which we can try out by grabbing another crystal ball in the wobbly wharf. Also, I beg you, pull out all the dangling spores. Not only are some of them hidden dwarfs needed to progress, but there are hidden chests that will be gone if you don't uncover them before you dispel the forest's curse. Rescuing dwarves was cool and all, but to meet with the elder we also have to rescue a lost child. It is in the watchtower area, so no biggie. Everyone is grateful, we get a literal piece of cheese for our troubles, and are finally able to meet the figurative Big Cheese himself. He gives us our first pig bag, an item essential to dispelling the curse associated with its evil pig. A pig bag is needed to reveal a pig gate leading to the pocket dimension of the pig in question. The blue evil pig will be one of the last ones to be discovered, as its gate is located in the final area of the game. Poetic. Talking to the elder ends the demo. When we got to that point with my cousin, I was quite disappointed, hoping for at least one boss fight. But alas, it was a really big demo. And then there was the AP box in the old pond, which was another disappointment when its contents were revealed to be more cheese. Before I forget, there's the thief event chain. Behind the elder's house, there's a hidden trapdoor. A guard will tell you about it if you talk to him. As soon as we enter the place, the lights will go out, so we have to get some other light source, like a torch held by this dwarf. Yeah, sure. We then accidentally help up possibly dangerous man escape his prison and have to resolve conflict between two dwarfs caused by a broken pot. Then there's the angry elder who fell into a hole caused by the thief who tried to escape. It feels awfully rushed, because it probably was. <sighs> The would-be escape artist will be as salty as I am right now, but he will tell us about treasures inside a mansion and about the telescope we already used. Then he just gives up. Or does he? He gets on parole. Totally. And after leaving the village, he will challenge us to a race to the top of Watchtower. It's really easy and there's a lot of leeway. We get silver powder for our efforts, another item that we can't do anything with, yet. Through the wobbly wharf we can get to the charity square, but outside of two charity wings, a broken fountain, some dwarfs to talk with and the leaf butterfly collector, 
Oh, hi, Jan. There's not much to do here. Yet. Instead, we can climb down from the top of the watchtower area to progress to the other forest. Hope you don't mind losing a few lives as this location can be infuriating. There's a dwarf preventing us from getting to the stormy mountains. He is an aspiring actor and wants us to show him a range of true emotions. Which is the gimmick of this area. By eating mushrooms growing around the forest, Tombi's emotional state will change to manic or depressive and the flowers will react accordingly. Uh, that always creeped me out. I'm sure that I would be traumatized if I had seen this as a kid. The little flowers become much more unpredictable once Tombi gets emotional, especially when the laughter is involved. By the way, you know how weird it felt when I heard this laughter in Undertale. I still think that face flowers are creepier. The platforms will rise and lower depending on the current mood. Once affected with laughing or crying, Tombi can't use his weapons and will emote instead. He'll also randomly emote from time to time, which can be suboptimal. Tombi can return to normal by eating a normal looking mushroom, which actually gets added to the inventory instead of being eaten on the spot. Be sure to grab an additional one as there will be someone who needs it. We could easily provide David Cage with enough emotions and continue our journey, but... I love this place. From my first complete playthrough, every time I come here for the first time, I just stop for a while, look at the beautifully drawn background, and let the music suit my soul. What is it with all the seemingly unimportant locations having such great tracks? You know, while Tombi got pretty great scores in the press, somehow the music got a mixed reception for whatever reason, and that's something that I cannot agree with. Every theme was perfectly crafted to suit its location. They are catchy, memorable, and a big part of making Tombi as great as it is. Harumi Fujita, the game's composer, did a marvelous job, and I'm so happy that she wanted to be a part of Fujiwara's project. Having worked with him before, as soon as she heard about Fujiwara opening his studio, she offered her help, basically begging him to let her do something for his new game. He agreed and dropped a huge workload on her, constantly sending her his visualizations of the game areas and asking for suitable music. While working on Tombi's soundtrack, Fujita became pregnant and worried that she wouldn't be able to do it, wanted to get out of the project. But thanks to Fujiwara's pleas, she stayed. She worked hard, stopping only to give birth, but after a week in the hospital, she got back and finished what she started. By listening to the fruits of her labor, I can say that it was worth it. She seems to think so too, reminiscing about her time at Whoopi Camp positively, at least in the interviews. The guy who nearly took one of our lives will offer a ride on his boat. We reach the back entrance to a familiar looking mansion. Inside there's a treasure room containing every type of treasure chest. We exit through the mansion right at the beginning of the game. 
As the boat ride is one way only, we'll have to use a charity wing to get back to the forest. And you can't enter the mansion from its front door, so every time you want to visit treasure room, prepare for a boat ride. Charity wings are a limited commodity. I think there's 29 of them to get, but as long as you don't use them too previously, you should be good. In the background of the forest, we're attacked by this weird jellyfish looking things called bonsujis. They come in pairs and you can defeat them only by throwing one onto another. But as soon as you grab one, the other one will run away. So you'll have to blind the first one by jumping on its side and then hitting it with the other one. Do that three times and you'll officially become a monster hunter. There's also an AP box containing the ordinary mushroom, which will cure laughing and crying and will never run out. For now, there's not much to do in the forest, so let's head out to... The weather can be a bit of a problem here. Damn you, evil pig! Our next objective is to get to the phoenix nest, to take a flight to the deep jungle. If only getting there was easy. The wind is really strong and affects Tombi's jump, so you have to be extra careful. Going back if you miss something is a real pain too. Don't worry about missing too much. It will be much easier to get once the curse is gone. As we go we meet Charles, who is in a bit of a pickle, as not only did he get stuck on a branch, but also his pants ripped. He had a second pair, but the wind took them away. You can get them from a guy at the end of the mountain, inside lava caves. Protecting Charles' modesty will reward us with a funky parasol, which is an equipable item that slows Tombi's fall after jumping. But it's really... Really not wise to use it while the wind is wrecking havoc. Oh, they knew. I'm sure that Whoopi Camp expected the player to equip it as soon as possible. And then die because of the wind. <laughs> it's a great item. Just not for this area in the current state. Phoenix Mountain is perhaps the biggest platforming challenge in the game. Not only are our jumps hampered by the weather, and there are a lot of bottomless pits, but there's also a new enemy type, Needle Gators, which are quite resilient and like to screw with your jumps, pushing you to your doom. There are also these weird bell-like plants just waiting to waste your time. Most of the events that we encounter here require the curse to be dispelled, so we'll get back to them later. We can get the healing herbs for Baron and a new pair of pants, though. Here we encounter our first emotion doors. To open them, Tombi needs to be afflicted with an emotional state corresponding to the doors. Traversing Phoenix Mountain is tough enough right now, we don't really need random laughing fits too. But then again, that's Yan's second hiding spot and we get some charity wings for that, so... After a sequence of high precision jumps, We can ride the phoenix, or travel to the end of the mountain and go to the lava caves. We can't progress because of the large fire blocking our way. Well, at least there are no overgrown moles or fiery eco-terrorists. There is a pathway leading to the beginning of the mountain nearby, allowing for a quick, safe return. 
reaching lava caves is a bit wasteful without acquiring the next key, but hey, at least you'll be able to get back to it with a charity wing. We ignore warnings from the tiny cowboy who is sitting by the phoenix nest and ride on. just to fall down seconds later. From the start we can see that Baku's village has a bit of a vermin problem. And that for whatever reason we can't leave the village. Even if the guard just moves aside after he says that you can't leave. In one of the houses, we meet a guy who gets a bit too much into being transformed into a mouse as he asks for cheese. Ten pieces to be exact. There's a fortune teller's house, which is empty for the moment. We can also hit the bar, where we are recognized for our monster hunting escapades and are awarded with another assignment. Now we're tasked with destroying five fruits of death. Now, would the death of that ecosystem be such a bad thing? To be able to leave the village, we have to do some errands to prove our worth. The first is finding a real baby mouse. Why did it come to the village and is wearing clothes? Nobody knows. Just find it in the bar, report it to the guy in town hall and we'll be able to take more serious matters in our own hands. Baku's village is famous for its wine, but the wine machine broke and nobody is able to properly relax anymore. The guy blocking the side exit will be our guide and will help us navigate to the lake and thus we enter another cursed location. This one is cursed in more than one sense. We can't do much about the mansion itself yet, as our guide will pester us endlessly if Tomby takes even one step in the wrong direction. We can break some colorful eggs on our way though. We pass the sad doors and enter the lake area. It's a really nice, relaxing place. I wouldn't mind staying here for a while. We take a valve, which was changed into a pipe at the last possible moment. They even forgot to change its sprite and icon. Now just to place it in the right spot. Right spot. Huh? What the... Where should I... I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind, mind staying, staying here, here for a while. I wouldn't mind staying here for a while. Staying here for a while. Staying here for a while. Yeah. Instead of using the item from our inventory, we just need to press the talk button in the right spot. Then go to the other one and press it again, as Tomby will place the pipe in the right place. For whatever reason, they changed this sequence a bit and made it a lot more messy. 
But now we can go back to the village and everyone can get smashed. They are adults, after all. Now that we are adored by the locals, we can leave the village freely, including the path to the haunted mansion. We can get some more information, as always, and I recommend you to do so. One of the villagers ate the wrong mushroom and is now bowling his eyes off. Giving him one of our healing mushrooms will solve the problem. And our reward is... Nothing! Other than being able to give him that shrunk coma pig from the beginning of the game. That hyped up reward is... A coca claw. One of the items needed for a later event. Thanks for nothing, Bozo. The fortune teller is back. But for whatever reason she didn't want to cooperate with me. Too little AP, I guess? Being able to leave allows us to deal with DEATH FRUITS Which are these little squash looking plants with faces. Destroying five of them and returning back to the bar will reward us with charity wings and a vitality max. Eh. Okay, let's go. This place is a mess. I'm not gonna lie. I don't like it. It's big, has a really confusing layout with way too many doors, which will drive you insane as you'll be walking in circles to find a room with an item you need to get. The new enemy type here is a blue coca bird which is a much more aggressive counterpart to its red cousin. They spawn only while this place is cursed. After the curse is gone, so will be the birds. They are a precious source of blue experience and AP points. They tend to protect the colorful eggs that we need to break to release the 1000 year old man from his fiery prison. His quarters are behind the big wooden doors. There are 15 eggs, 8 on the south side, 1 on the east side and 6 on the north side. The last egg is behind the door that requires a small key, which you'll get from the cowboy held at the fork point. It's the only door requiring that key. If you haven't broken 14 eggs, this one will be shielded. As a thank you, the thousand year old man will give us his key and will tell us more about evil pigs. With the key in hand, we can get some treasure, including the stone boomerang, which has the same range as the wooden one but is much more powerful and can kill some enemies even without charging up. There's also a room with a picture of a big key. While exploring the mansion, we could find pieces of the big key. Boomerang can be helpful in getting this one in particular without ending ourselves. The last piece is behind smiling doors. So we have to visit the forest. Again. But with Funky Parasol, this place is much more manageable. In the forest, there are two treasure chests of interest we can get. The thousand year old bell and the mysterious mushroom, which will get us emotional at our command. Crying doors have nothing of interest outside of cheese and some fruits. Oh, and if you're hurt, you can rest in that little fountain and it will heal you after a while. By putting five parts of the key together in the picture room, we can enter the door with a big keyhole that holds pink pig bag. By the way, even after completing this game multiple times, I still spend about an hour here looking for eggs and items. <sighs> Entering the chimney leads us to our first jewel, 
Power jewels require a full experience bar corresponding to their color. Fire jewel here requires a full red XP bar. You gain XP by jumping on enemies. You get red XP from comma pigs and red coca birds. You can easily grind it in the forest of all beginnings or the forest of 100 flowers. Green from the propeller bugs and flying pigs in the lava caves. As they respawn it's the best place to grind it. And finally blue from butamushi, needle gators, blue coca birds and later fish. Blue coca birds are the best for this, but needle gators aren't so bad. To fill out the XP bar you need to bite the enemies 100 times. That's why it's better to not throw the enemies at each other. If you want points just throw them to the floor. With a full XP bar we can grab the jewel of fire. Equipping it will cause Tombi to set himself on fire instead of using a weapon, destroying everything he comes into contact with. There's a cooldown period after using every jewel's powers. The trade-off is that coming into contact with water will deal double damage. Also, Tombi's hair turns red. You can use the fire powers to burn the wall straw in the mansion, but there's a little reason to do it now. Returning to the Bakus Plaza will reveal a 1000 year old chest with an orange pig bag. Really nice! With big key we can get red pig bag in the Phoenix Mountain. It's best to get to the platform from the back plane, left from the place we got to ride the Phoenix. Near the end of the mountain there's a chest holding a grapple, which is more of a tool than a weapon. It has a longer range than blackjack, doesn't do any damage, but allows you to attach yourself to platforms, grapple yourself up and down, or swing around and gain momentum. It's really fun and helpful, but would you expect anything different from someone who developed rock and rope and bionic commando? Near the beginning of lava caves, inside the chest is another pig bag, and we can't progress further without dealing with its evil pig. The red fortune teller will tell you the location of its domain, the mansion on the lake. It's behind the smiling doors, by the way. Hey, what is it? What is it? Nah, you got me. You're a marginal intellectual. You're a sixth and pharmacist. Each evil pig battle takes place inside a special area specific to that pig. It's astounding how much work had to be done for a place that the player will see for only a few minutes. Also, each evil pig is different and uses character. It's so sad that their appearances are so brief. Yeah. Each boss can be dealt with in less than 30 seconds if you're really lucky. One good throw is all it takes. Remember to use ordinary mushroom at the start of the battle or before it, or you'll be in for a surprise. Defeating the green evil pig will make it rain inside the lava cave, solving the fire problem. After defeating each boss, a cutscene showing their curse being lifted shows up, and the one we've just seen right now is… quite different than the others. Let me show you by defeating the other evil pig we are able to beat right now, by climbing the central platform in Charity Square and jumping to the left, a red evil pig gate will be uncovered. You can also go back to the village and give the healing herbs to Baron, progressing the quest. The red evil pig is probably the most annoying one to capture. Even though his magic doesn't do any damage, it will toss you around and drop you on the spiked ground. And the pig back is placed on a rotating windmill. 
There is a trick though, as long as you swing on the pole, his magic won't affect you. By capturing Red Evil Pig, the wind dies down in Phoenix Mountain. You've noticed that, right? That the animation was different? The sparkles, the jingle, the way the camera is showing the changes? Meanwhile, the rain extinguishing lava caves feels like using the furious tornado at the beginning of the game. And that's exactly the case. You see, as was confirmed by the wonderful members of the Tomba Club, the fire issue with lava caves was supposed to be solved with an item called Rain Essence, found at the Haunted Mansion, while the green pig bag was supposed to be at a completely different location. We're slowly reaching the messy parts of the game. With lava caves cooled off, grapple in our hands and the parasol on our back, we can explore lava caves fairly safely. The new enemy type, endemic to this area, is a flying coma pig that can transform into a bat. They are a great source of green experience, and if you screw up, you can use the grapple on them to avoid falling. There are a lot of treasure chests, but with the umbrella slowing Tombi's fall, their contents can fall into the abyss before you'll be able to grab them. Don't worry, they will respawn once you re-enter. For now, our priority is getting 5 bunk flowers, which are Phoenix's favorite food. There's an additional one you can find here, for whatever reason. But, before getting to the big bird, if you have a pink pig bag, you can fight another boss. I completely forgot about getting his pig bag, so he was the second to last evil pig I fought, but sure, let's defeat him now. This pig's magic causes thunder to strike. It electrifies the elements of the arena that are the same color as the place it hits, and his thunder does a lot of damage. A lot of damage. But as with every evil pig, this one too requires just one throw. And thus, Haunted Mansion is no longer haunted. Other than that, by climbing the left side of the cave, we can reach a platform with an easily missed pump rock and a thief's loot. The fact that there's no ceiling above the pump rock is the only hint that there's a secret entrance to the hidden village. The same one Jan comes from. We even meet his dad who sends us on a mission to deliver his lunch. Don't use it! You'll give it to Jan next time you'll meet him automatically as you'll speak with him. Selecting it from the inventory will make Tombi eat it even if he's in full health, which is especially confusing as there's a hungry guy who needs to be fed a lunchbox. If you're feeling generous, you can give him a large lunchbox, it doesn't matter, but only these two items work. Lunchboxes restore 7 HP, while the large lunchbox will always restore your HP to the max. Outside of seeing that big golden egg, there's nothing much to do here. We leave the village, give what the thief lost to him in that little cage area of the cave and finally get to the phoenix. After we feed him, we're free to go, this time without any accidents.
This place is rough in more than one meaning of the word. The pig's curse turned the local tribe, Masakari, hostile and they are incredibly annoying to deal with unless you use the jewel of fire to commit war crimes on the indigenous people. Being on fire also prevents biting plants from, well, biting you in the ass. Jungle versions of biting plants are vicious. Just touching those deals too damage while getting chomped will obliterate 4 points, which is the most you can lose at once in the game. Sadly, magic powers have a bit of a cooldown and work only for 5 seconds. Still, it was nice to find a suitable use for the jewel. The entrance to the village of civilization is blocked by a worker who lost his hat. Uh huh, sure. Anyway, it looks like Charles got away with it, which gives us an excuse to find him. While traversing the jungle, we can catch the remaining four leaf butterflies. By climbing on the palm tree, we can reach a chest with another vitality max, but it won't increase the max health beyond the 8 we have already, until we get another item. Don't worry though, the game remembers all your additional vitality maxes and will raise the gauge once the item in question is collected. Jan will be hiding at the top of the building left from the tree as long as he was encountered at Charity Square and inside the smiling door in Phoenix Mountain. By talking to him while having his lunchbox, we finish the takeout event and receive more cheese. Climbing to the top of the tree and jumping to the left will lead to another evil pig battle. Orange evil pig is… nothing special. His magic attack is dropping a large boulder on us. The arena is really narrow and vertical, but it's one of, if not the, easiest of battles thanks to the bug's placement and thus Baku's village returns to normal. Pro tip, don't get inside any of the cages, it ends in a darkly comedic way. You know, I'm kind of mad that they didn't put any items like a lunchbox or even simply a fruit just to bait the players. Perhaps they knew that we would try it anyway. We find bananas and, not too long after, Charles. We nearly drown again, but he helps us and offers to teach us how to swim. For a price. He doesn't want bananas though because that would be too simple. But banana juice? That's more like it. You can annoy him by trying to give him bananas we just found or return the miner's hat Charles gave to us. What's amazing is how much foresight Whoopi Camp had while making this event chain to prevent a potential soft lock. You see, without learning how to swim, you can't leave Masakari Jungle without the use of charity wings or bells, which there is a small possibility that you don't have them on you. Charles will be in deep jungle even if you have never interacted with him before, which is also a possibility. What's fun is the fact that if one didn't complete the Hungry Monkey event and hasn't learned Animal Dash, the 100 year old chest in the mansion will contain it instead of the normal 20,000 AP coin. So both Hungry Monkey and Charles Pants are optional events, giving Miner his hat will grant us the ability to enter the village of civilization, 
though most of it will be closed off to us. Most of what's left from it, that is. Eh. We can still visit the clock tower, though, to meet with our minor friend. He is famous for his juices. If we give him bananas, he really gets into his hobby. <laughs> okay, enough. We return to Charles and in exchange for juice, we learn how to swim. The lesson is brief and simple. With our new skill, we are allowed to progress by swimming through the river and reaching an even deeper part of the jungle, where we find the remaining pump rocks and an old tree accompanied by a talking parrot, who serves as our mediator in conversation with the tree of knowledge. All that jumping on the pump rocks was to feed the tree of knowledge with juicy nutrients from the earth. And so we jump on the last pump rock to finish this incredibly annoying event. Oh, kurwa. So, yeah, as always, I've missed one of 24 pump rocks and had to travel the world again from start to finish just to step on it. It was the one on the higher placed platform in Phoenix Mountain. Also, don't be like me and don't forget to grab the fruit of knowledge for Baron. I thought you have to finish the Pump Rocks event for it and just now realize that you don't, leading Baron to the original sin. We're able to finish his event chain by getting the last piece of the puzzle, seaweed from the mansion's beach. After that, Baron is fully healed and all grown up. What does that mean? It means that charity wings are now obsolete. Thanks to being able to use Baron for unlimited fast travel. As we are traveling the world anyway, let's get some events out of the way. In Charity Square, there is a dwarf blocking entrance to something called Leaf Slider. He tells us about his begging fetish, so we comply, clearing both the event and the way. Before taking the Leaf Slider, it's good to collect the last crystal ball. For the future, you know. Leaf Slider trip. Sends us to Mushroom Forest and gives us a blue powder, which can be used to make one of the face flowers, well, blue. Throwing a blue flower onto a red one. Throwing a blue flower onto a red one will create a forbidden mushroom, which will transform Tombi into a black and white version of himself in the forbidden state. Tombi will be extremely fast and jump much higher. It has the same effect as a powerful endgame equipable item. The catch? If you die, you'll become normal and have to do this chain all over. Leaf Slider will provide more blue powder. The kid from Dwarf Village is looking for seeds to plant. You can find them in this little alcove in the watchtower area. It's good to do this as early as you can, as the growth of the plant is AP dependent. You have to finish a few events for it to grow, or grind for AP by defeating enemies. Next to the phoenix nest, there's the jewel of wind. 
It's an interesting item as it allows Tombi to run faster and float for a while in the air. I like it. Too bad that you get it only after visiting Masakari Jungle. As soon as you press the final pump rock, the event will be completed. The Tree of Knowledge is all healthy now and will answer our questions if we stumble upon one. As with everything in this game, we'll do it later. Returning to the village of civilization, the Juice Man will be so impressed with us for swimming in the Masakari River that he'll entrust us with the task of fixing the machine that runs everything in the village of civilization. We are allowed to visit the remaining two areas. Iron Castle, the area I was really hyped about once I've seen it on screenshots online, and the Lumberjack Factory. Iron Castle is... disappointing, to say the least. Our job is to turn the main machine that is behind the rusted doors. There are also two other rooms with really disappointing loot, Lumberjack Factory is nearly as bare bones as Iron Castle. We have blown open metal doors leading to a well holding charity wings. There are two guys, one of them tells us about a bomb masked as a coconut that could be used to open the rusty doors. We get a lot of mileage from that palm tree, huh? The other guy tells us about a pair of special yellow bansujis that hold a bottle that could be used to gather flower tears. Sadly, these monsters will appear only after the curse of the blue evil pig is cleared. With the bomb in our hands, we blow the pesky doors. Tombi is too cool to look at the explosions. And then we turn on the machinery saving the day. Whoa, whoa. Here I come. Oh, here I come. Iron Castle's engineer will tell us about the 10,000 year old man who is living in a place called Trick Village. We can get to it through all pond thanks to the key we get for our troubles. Also, a raft is placed at the Lumberjack Factory, which can then be used to get from the Masakari River to the Haunted Mansion. It was the intended way of leaving the Masakari jungle, clearing the Village of Civilization spotline also causes this guy to appear. He tells us about a cute witch living in the village of all beginnings. So, let's check this out. Actually, no, let's not. There is something that I need to say. Something that you might already know about or might have suspected. Tombi is an unfinished game. Well, I mean you can complete it, there's an ending and all, but a lot of content was scrapped. I remember the first time I got to play the full version of Tombi. It was actually the first game I downloaded after getting the internet. It all was amazing until I would reach Masakari Jungle and the Village of Civilization. Even at 10 years old, something felt off, like it was rushed, and it was. The first half of Tombi is poetry, a work of art. Everything feels like it belongs in the right place. Well, outside the shenanigans with the green evil pig, but that's an aftermath of the mess that is the village of civilization case. And then, as soon as one reaches the jungle, everything falls apart. The village of civilization was supposed to be a lot more, with its own curse, which caused all three groups associated with stone, wood and iron, respectively, 
to fall out. Everything ended with getting a green pig bag. There's even an FMV of the curse being lifted from the Village of Civilization on the game's CD, which could be accessed by the use of Action Replay or extracted using external software and PC. There's a lot of other data and sprites, suggesting that there were a lot more events planned for the Village of Civilization and those that are still present in the game were of much higher complexity. The guy who tells you about the bomb was actually supposed to make a bomb for you with the items you collected from the jungle. Tomba Club made a really great video about it, and over 90% of my knowledge about Tombi's cut content came from their videos. Thanks Tomba Club, you're one of my favorite channels. Also, Masakari Jungle was planned to be more expansive, with the ability to visit the tribe's village and meet their elder, an event in which you create a fungus drum instead of simply finding it, like in the final release, with its plotline ending with, probably, receiving the navy pig bug, which, spoiler, lies inside the chest next to the tree of knowledge, right behind the cut Masakari village. I'll put as much into describing the Trig Village section as Whoopi Camp put into it. The curse of this place caused it to be fully submerged underwater, which made its inhabitants lock themselves up inside their houses. We can assume that the guy who watched us nearly drown and then took us on a boat ride is from Trig Village, as he stood near the door leading to it, knew about its curse, and told us that we're not ready for it, as, well, we couldn't swim. You know how many Trig Villagers we meet? One. 10,000-year-old man sends us on the fascinating quest of looking for numbered beads underwater. Because we are not skilled for the job, he tells us about a mermaid who has lost her pendant and will probably teach us how to dive. Said mermaid resides in the haunted mansion and will be very happy once we return her lost item. Diving and swimming underwater is quite simple and non-intrusive in this game. I like it. There aren't many places where you can use it outside the Trig Village, but still. As an additional reward, we get mighty fish food. You can use it in three places to max out experience bars without grinding. All Pond for red, this room with a pipe in Haunted Mansion for green, and Masakari River for blue. While we are here, we can also burn this wall made of straw to find Yan for the final time. Now that the Village of Civilization's machinery works, we can also take an elevator ride to reach underground, but nope, Trek Village first, as much as I dislike this place for being a symbol of the unfinished later half of the game, I love the music of Cursed Trig Village. I really do. It fits a flooded place like this. Our enemies here are fish that give out blue experience and can be a pain to grab without getting hurt. We traverse a simple labyrinth of paths, seeking math beads. Originally, they planned to have 15 of them, but that was scrapped, probably for the better. I wouldn't mind if there were more screens with more variation though. There's also the Jewel of Water, which is useless. 
It works like the jewel of fire. It surrounds Tombi with water and destroys everything he touches and can function underwater. But you can't activate it underwater, destroying its only purpose. Why? Also, this little tunnel will throw you out to the Masakari jungle, so be careful. One filler event later, 10,000 year old man gives us his apologies and a key for passing his test. He then totally omits the story of the evil pigs he promised us and tells us to meet a million year old man. Eh, whatever. With his key we can get some treasures from Trek Village like this Vitality Max, the big AP gem and the yellow pig bag. Oh, by the way, the chest next to the entrance to Trig Village contains yet another bell. Not that it matters now that we have Baron. Returning to 10,000 year old man initiates another event, and this is a big one. For the low, low price of 5 golden items, this crazy old bastard offers us one of his fish. We can also ask the Tree of Knowledge about the golden items. Fulfilling another event, though it omits one golden item. We also get the navy pig bag. By getting a lot of AP and finishing events, the seed we gave to the dwarf child bloomed into a golden flower. Giving the remaining leaf butterflies to the collector will make them lift the cage high up to the sky, ending in a hidden village where the big egg contains the golden butterfly. You can also talk to Jan, who will reward us with the golden bow. It's not one of the golden items required by the old man, but it will make us able to have more than 8 HP. Finally, in exchange for 10 pieces of cheese, the collector from Bacchus village, who isn't even a mouse anymore, will give us a golden fruit. Cheese. 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 To get the golden candy we have to meet the witch residing in the village of all beginnings. The doors to her house taunted me for way too long. And hey, the guy was right. Mizuno is, actually, quite cute, even if her sprite is placed a bit lower than it should. It makes her look even shorter than she really is. She wants to make candy, but we don't have all the ingredients yet. She has another event for us, though. We return three crystal balls and the magic mirror we collected a long time ago. She then asks us to come later while hyping up the next event. And she really delivers. By taking our grapple and blackjack in front of the mirror, she creates a monster that is grapple jack. It has unbelievable range, one-shots most enemies while keeping the utility of grapple. Remember that it kills enemies so you can't hook onto them as you could with the use of grapple. We have three ingredients required to make candy, silver powder, coca clove and biting plant fruit, but there are still three others needed. Molasses is hidden in a cave blocked by a Masakari tribesman. You just need to give him his drum to make him move out of the way. By the way, Phoenix Mountain is so nice without the wind, isn't it? We can enter the doors that were locked because of the wind. Their content is disappointing, but at least the event is done. Also, the digger is done and we can get some more cheese if you still need it. 
You can go underground from Watchtower, it's required for an event, Forest of All Beginnings, or Haunted Mansion. The underground is quite boring. I feel like it's a storage room for all the items from events that were never implemented, like Needle Gator Teeth and Butamushi's Torn. You can also find an additional biting plant fruit, perfect if you didn't get one at the beginning, and cold medicine. There's another digger, to complete his event you have to defeat all 7 evil pigs, unlocking the shortcut. We're then blocked by closed doors. A nearby digger tells us about a wire left somewhere in Twig Village. 10,000 year old man has it. The wire breaks after use, starting another event. There's also a blue fortune teller who, if you have enough AP, will tell you the locations of the remaining evil pigs. I'm not sure how much he wants. Less than 800,000, that for sure. He also gives us another vitality max. You might have noticed a pattern. There are red and blue fortune tellers, the same colors as the XP we gathered. In fact, there was another fortune teller. Green, obviously. But, as with nearly everything associated with the village of civilization, he got scrapped. I mean, it makes sense to have the information about Pig Gate's locations being more spread out. To get unbreakable wire, we must visit the Haunted Mansion, which isn't haunted anymore. Originally, there wasn't haunted in its name either. It was Thieves' Mansion, because, well, it was the place where thieves originally hanged out, but had to move out after Pink Evil Pig appeared. Now they have returned. We've met some of them before, like the guy from Phoenix Mountain or the Forgetful Thief. Speaking of which, he lost his stuff. Again. And it's in the same place it was before. He rewards us with more cheese. Lovely. Most of the thieves are actually quite special. Like this guy who is just having a blast, has a unique sprite and doesn't have any other role. Or the boss who has lost his treasure, even if it's next to him in a chest. Uh, it's a really weird event that just screams unfinished, especially since the boss's treasure just sits in your inventory doing nothing. You can also get another one, Vitality Max, from a chest left by a grateful thief. You get the wire from a digger chilling by the healing fountain. Having it in hand allows us to navigate the underground freely. Nearly. Another point of interest is the million years old man's room. After complimenting Tombi's beautiful eyes, he tells us the secret about the evil pig's power. It's gold. Must resist. Then we get the final key and are told to seal the remaining pigs. Let's start with entering the blue evil pig gate that was taunting us all that time we were here. Blue evil pig is kind of a goofy boss fight. There's this weird contraption that, in theory, can hurt Tombi if he touches the cactus-like plants. And the pig himself can throw spore balls with decent accuracy. But with the way the pig bag is positioned, it's really easy to make the winning throw. Finally, restoring the forest to its prime.
With the unbreakable wire and the millionaire old key, we can open the chest containing a treasure worth 300,000 AP and finish another event that always puzzled me until I watched Slap Story by Tomba Club. It's a wonderful video about perhaps the most interesting event in the entire game that got scrapped. A puzzle sprawling through the whole game. Actually, some of its elements were still left in the game. I always thought that this thing next to the Watchtower's Arias entrance was some sort of weird cabinet. And then there was that plate with a line in how to mention. I tried to interact with it by using every key I had on me, but to no effect. These two are doodle rocks, holding hands to the puzzle. Sadly, now all it takes is a few seconds to resolve this event which was supposed to be the crown jewel of the underground. Oh well. Be sure to check out that video if you haven't already. Before getting every chest in the game, let's visit Mizuno again. Poor girl caught a cold while we were away, so we present her with totally legit medicine that we found underground. As a reward, we get another Vitality Max. Then we put every ingredient into the cauldron, one by one. But hey, here's golden candy. Thanks for all, Mizuno. The final golden item, not mentioned by the Tree of Knowledge, is the golden medal. You can enter the motocross hut from the start of the game, but to participate you need to at least finish the village of civilization. The guy in the lumberjack factory maintains things called go-go cars, but they can't run on water, requiring some type of fuel. The missing fuel ingredient being wine. To be honest, wine might sound a bit inefficient as a fuel source, as only about 12 of it is ethanol, which is quite good source of energy as it burns well, and 86% is water. But waste created during the wine production works quite well. The more you know. We can get wine from a guy in Baku's village as long as we talk to the mechanic Mechanic then creates a fuel bar with the magic of civilization. With the fuel bar in hand, we can go to the shed and go for a ride. Motocross course is a weird minigame. It's short and simple, you press right and never let go to accelerate and the jump with the X button. Jumping should be used only when there's an obstacle that would massively slow down the car, as you can't accelerate while you're in the air after all. There are three medals to get, each with its own event, and they don't stack. You should get bronze if you do nothing, or nearly nothing at all. You'll get silver by trying to get the gold, and the gold for, well, through trial and error. There's a quite reliable strategy by Joe's guy. You need to only jump three times, once you reach the first draft, and then over the second and third pig. Just remember to go visit the mermaid by pressing up. If you go all the way to the right, you'll have to do the course again. For winning the bronze medal, you also get a vitality max. Also, getting the gold medal time will make the mermaid so impressed that she'll break the fourth wall. 
The upper road of the course has some items, but is completely non-viable if you want to get a good time. I think with all five golden items we go to the 10,000 year old man to get a psychic fish, which puts Stomby into a forbidden state, as mixing mushrooms did. It's a bit of disappointing reward for so much effort, especially as you can get the better fish so much easier. Lifting the forest's curse outside of making everything so much prettier and causing the dwarf village to become a place of cult gatherings. Seriously, what's with this music? Causes the yellow variant of Bonsuji to spawn. Mechanically, they are exactly the same as the standard ones. They drop a tear bottle after being defeated. Finding a big yellow face flower and using rice and shine powder, which, come to think of it, was also dropped by Bonsuji, will make it cry. And with a bottle, we're able to collect its tears to then use them on the fountain in Charity Square to unpetrify the cherubs. Yeah, that's quite an event, Che. Well, holy water gets a new meaning. Having over a million AP allows us to get the sacred fish, which makes us fast as fuck, boy. Even while not animal dashing, and also allows jumping higher than when the psychic fish is equipped. Curiously, both fish are equipped instead of pants, but luckily Tomba still wears a pair. But yeah, I expected better. Even though we have all the keys, there's not much interesting treasures to get other than the final Vitality Max and the Iron Boomerang, both found in Phoenix Mountain. Iron Boomerang is… really meh. I mean, it was so insignificant and randomly placed that it took me quite a bit of playthroughs to even find out that it exists. You get it so late and you already have Grapple Jack, which has superior range and can one-hit most of the enemies. Iron Boomerang kills everything it hits and can grab items for you. But its non-charged range is horrible and by the time you'll get it, there won't be anything to grab with it. I think that it was supposed to be a reward from something in the Iron Castle, which was supposed to be a lot bigger, but got scrapped, so they put it in a random million year old chest. Overall equipment review. Blackjack has better range than boomerangs, which can be used to grab items from the overworld and get progressively stronger. Grapple has a long range doesn't cause any damage, even charged, and allows hooking to the surfaces and enemies. Grapple Jack has the longest range and kills nearly everything while being even better as a mobility tool. Pants are simply progressively better, giving higher speed and jumping ability. Same is true for both fish, which are better than flash pants. With every key in our stomach, we can go to the mansion to get the rest of the treasures, but this time the other doors are opened. We go downstairs to the dining room, and today it's pork for dinner. Navy Evil Pig 
who is also the only female in the group, throws flasks filled with poisonous gas that stay for a while. The layout of her place is quite okay, nothing too troubling. With the navy evil pig gone, Masakari tribesmen become peaceful again. The jungle looks nicer too, there's only one evil pig to go. The yellow evil pig gate is inside the bell in clock tower. Yellow evil pig is fought, quite fittingly, underwater. It's a really interesting fight, and potentially the shortest one as it is extremely easy to get a good shot. Just grab the pig at the right time, as his magic can summon conches that launch after a bit of delay and can hurt you while you try to bite him. With yellow evil pig sealed, Trig Village's flood problem is gone. Mostly. Honestly, this location is more annoying without the water. And yeah, it's still a ghost town. With the seventh evil pig defeated, we're summoned by the million-year-old man to a strange room underground. We could enter it earlier and with each evil pig defeated, a statue of it would appear in front of the large doors. With seven statues, the doors open. There's one final evil pig for us to capture. But as soon as we want to enter the last gate, evil pigs scatter and it closes, leaving us with nothing. But if we find seven people wanting to stand on the pedestals, it will open again. And thus, the most infamous event in the game begins. We have to visit each populated location in search for NPCs that weren't there before, to recruit them as glorified paperweights. Also, the digger finally finished his shortcut. Village of Civilization holds three friends, one from each section. I would like to think that originally a Masakari tribesman and someone from Trig Village would also be friends. Thus, having a one representative from each of affected lands, as Green Evil Pig curse originally affected village of civilization, navy evil pig Masakari jungle, and in the final release there is no trick villagers. Though that still leaves us with only six friends, as Phoenix Mountain doesn't have any inhabitants, millionaire old man told us to return to him even if we were missing one friend probably because he wanted to be the last one. But then he's upstaged by Baron. Yes, even if you didn't do any of his events. I know that I should say that before, but I got pretty surprised by that too. As soon as you talk to millions after recruiting six friends, you'll reach the point of no return and have to finish the game. So if you want to have a complete game, be sure to complete all events before that. If you have 127 events, you're good to go. The final evil pig boss fight is… weird. 
His only way to damage us is if Tombi touches him, as his magic costs time to... Stop. That's it. Everything just to annoy the player. It can be tough to grab him in time and then throw into the pig bag from the ground level. So I suggest standing on one of the platforms. Prepare to do a lot of nothing during this fight. At least the background is nice. That pigga got a lot of bling, dog. Originally, the real evil pig was supposed to use an arsenal of attacks of other evil pigs, depending on how many events you completed. But because of a programming mistake, it doesn't work. The code is still in the game and you can activate it, but playing the game the legit way, you'll never see anything other than time stop. To be honest, he would be much less annoying if he used other attacks. And even though he is a final boss, it takes just one throw to defeat him, completing the remaining story events. The island collapse, we fly away on Baron, meet with the really old guy squirted, and then Tombi just leaves. Roll the credits. We are rated on our progress and... Oh, yeah, I missed finishing one event. The one with the elevator and the watchtower. But in this video, I absolutely forgot about the barrel quest. If you roll the barrel down the bridge and come here when you can dive... The event ends. Yeah, that's it. And what do we get for completing the game with all events done? Nothing. If you missed an event, there will be a little hint for you so you can nab it during your next playthrough. Or when you load the previous save. What are my thoughts about the game, you may ask? Well, Tombi or Tomba, because it was much easier to find the NTSC version, was the first game that I acquired after getting access to the internet back in a day. It was like meeting with an old childhood friend after so many years of being apart. It felt great, even if the first half was much better than the latter, I still believe it's a little masterpiece. Well, a masterpiece that was never properly finished. <coughs> Thus, leaving its audience longing for more. But the art style, sense of humor, creativity, fantastic soundtrack made it really special. It's still a great game to this day. It never sold enough copies to get into Platinum or other budget series. And the initial print was quite small by itself, so 
the prices can get quite wild. It was available, albeit briefly, on the PS Store. And as much as I don't like limited run games, for plenty of reasons, even if I tend to get their games if I see them on local auction sites, I'm quite happy that Tombi will get a re-release and with a new soundtrack by Harumi Fujita to boot. So yeah, I wholeheartedly recommend you getting the game, no matter how or what. It's only a few hours long. It took me 6 hours to complete, but only because I wanted to get every treasure chest got lost for 20 minutes in Haunted Mansion and I missed that one pump rock. It's the definition of short and sweet. Soon after getting my own modded PS1 in September 2000, I got a call from my cousin. She told me that the new demo disc has a Tombi 2 demo. A multitude of emotions hit me at once. The game dealers didn't have Tombi 2 yet, so the thought of experiencing that demo was constantly on my mind, even with Pokemania around to distract me. Somewhere in the middle of October, we visited my aunt. I sprinted to their PlayStation, wanting to play the demo. We put the black disc with the number 60 and 